Right, we are live on news up here at Adesawe Kanda, also live on Twitter and on Facebook, the SFA channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfredo Kansi. Tonight, we hear from one of the men at the center of the IGP's leak tape scandal, COP Alex Mensa, and also from the lawyer of the Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Kufudan Parias, as the committee probing the issue resumes sitting tomorrow. Stay with us here on Ghana Tonight. Also, we have updates on the attack on the UTV by facts identified as members of the New Patriotic Party. There's also been a wide condemnation from individuals and organizations. We have it all for you tonight. Want to know the status of the people who were arrested? These facts will tell you. On Ghana tonight, also embattled former sanitation minister Cecilia Dapa prays the court to hear the OSP's case against her earlier than the scheduled date because the freezing of her accounts and seizure of her money is causing her hardship, stress and embarrassment. We have some details for you. Stay with us here on Ghana tonight as always. And uh, well, very, very interactive. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. Well, let's settle for Ghana Briefs. Three outsourced maintenance workers have drowned in an underground fuel tank belonging to Cocobot in a Fidiasi near Koforidia. The deceased were contracted to repair the leaking tank. Three meals, one looked aged. If I could guess, he's an elderly man who would be around 50 years. And then the other ones, if I should guess their age, would be between 30 and 40 years. Three of them were rescued and then they were handed over to the police service and they were sent to St. Joseph Hospital. The Africa Education Watch says it has uncovered an escalation of examination malpractices with candidates paying as much as 1,000 cities for exam questions and favors. Eight monitoring of the just ended West African Senior School Certificate Examination, WASI, shows that leaked exam questions were solved by some teachers and transmitted through WhatsApp platforms for candidates. This follows earlier revelations by the West African Examinations Council, WAYEC, that the level of malpractices is so high to the extent that it is unable to put a figure to it. According to Edwatch, inadequate external security and supervisors fueled the mass leakage of questions. While this is not new, Africa Education Watch is urging WAYEC and relevant bodies to amend the WAYEC Act and institute stiffer sanctions against corporate, including outright dismissal of GES staff involved in such act. <laughs> The majority leader of Sai Chairman Sabonsu says the minority could have invited the governor of the Bank of Ghana to parliament to explain matters relating to the loss of the 60.2 billion cities, among others, instead of the street protest. He tells TV3 in an interview that after the protest against the governor, it will be difficult for his side to support the minority if they should come with a motion in the House. We could have invited a governor to come and talk to issues that are not clear to us. You go on a demonstration, you organize a press conference against them, what you think is happening within the corridors, and then you go on a demonstration. Then you come back to parliament to move a motion. Do you want me to support that? Like now you have made up your mind that whatever has been done by them is inappropriate, I'm not going to countenance it, you bring him. So if he comes to explain, are you going to take it? Leadership of Democracy Hub and Fix the Country say they will return to the street all throughout the month of December to demand the resignation of the president. The two groups are accusing the president of incompetence while supervising a government of friends, family, 
and concubines. That's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, we have updates on the attack on the UTV by thugs identified as members of the New Patriotic Party. Uh, there's also been a wide condemnation from individuals and organizations. We, we have that for you here on Ghana Tonight. Stay with me. Um, we'll, we'll get into it shortly. But just for the benefit of the uninitiated, this is exactly... Uh, what happened on Saturday evening during that program uh, on UTV. Take a look. When they are done with this one, the next thing is that either they take him off their shoes and they stop are not the going to the anybody. You want to do the They are not going to go We just came in and got in and we are here. See, see, I'm going to show you the time, no eyes of the time. Ooh! I'm telling you! We are here today. Uh -huh. Now we are seeing that the show is are sent to a politics. Yes, a political show. So we are from MPP. We are, we are from MPP. We are here today. Yes, you are coming. 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 Yes, you Well, so these are the, the persons who invaded the, the studios of UTV that night. They've identified themselves. So right now, there's no doubt who they are exactly. Because they say NPP, polling station executives, consultancy executives, members of the New Patriotic Party. But you see, let's set the base for this discussion so that we understand exactly what we're dealing with. The Constitution guarantees press freedom under Article 60, 162. Take a look at this. Specifically, just for the benefit of, of you or viewers, Article 162, freedom and responsibility of the media. That freedom also imposes some responsibility on us. So let's not lose sight. Editors and publishers of newspapers and other institutions of the mass media shall not be subject, and the emphasis is on shall, shall not be subject to control or interference by government, nor shall they be penalized or harassed for their editorial opinions and views or the content of their publications. Emphasis on shall they be penalized or harassed for their editorial opinions and views or the content of their publications. It goes on to say, this is 1624. Now, take a look at this. That specifically indicates exactly what... Um, the Constitution says, it says, any medium, in the previous in instance, let's, let's look at the previous slide. It says, any medium in within which this particular publication is done or made cannot and should not be subject to any form of harassment. Now, take a look at this as well. This is 162 of the 1992 Constitution, specifically on all state media. It says, all state-owned media shall afford fair opportunities and facilities for the presentation of divergent views and dissenting opinions. That's the emphasis there. This is specifically respect to all state-owned media shall afford fair opportunities and facilitate for the presentation of divergent views and dissenting opinions. This is specifically to state-owned media, right? So you take into consideration the fact that this is a privately-owned media. Now, when you are, in any case, aggrieved, 
or you don't, you're not too happy about the content or publication or issues discussed on a particular program, on a private media house. Take a look at this. The National Media Commission has some provision to take care of that. Section 13 of the National Media Commission Act 1993, Act 449, complaint may be lodged with the commission. One, a person aggrieved by a publication or by the act or omission of a journalist, newspaper proprietor, a publisher, or any other person in respect of a publication in the media, continues. It says, these are the avenues. May lodge a complaint before the commission against the editor, publisher, proprietor. So in the case of the private media, the proprietor or that other person. And not, and not to mobilize people or hooligans, for that matter, to go and attack, attack anybody in, in the media house. This is what the law says. A person who has lodged a complaint with the commission shall, unless the complainant is withdrawn or the complaint is withdrawn, exhaust all avenues available for settling the issue by the commission before a recourse to the courts. So look at the process. And then it goes on. Specific references. There are issues and what the law provides that it should be done. These are the laid down procedures. And in, in the law, it does not in any way, shape or form talk about persons storming a, a media house for that matter. Now, these persons identify themselves as members of the MPP, executives of the party at the constituency level and polling station level. Richard Ahiagba is director of communications of the new patriotic party. They've issued a statement which was signed by him. He's joining us on Zoom. Zayagba, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. So we have a copy of the statement that you issued and signed. You're saying that you're going to cooperate uh, with, with the Ghana police service on this particular issue and, and the persons who have been arrested. How have you been cooperating with the police so far since this incident happened on Saturday night? Uh, well, thank you, Alfred. Um, we, our indication is that uh, any time the police need us uh, to answer any question, to produce or give uh, access to any of the individuals who were uh, uh, booked the, the last time for having breached the security of uh, TV, uh, UTV, I think we're ready to cooperate with them. We don't know what else they will need from us, but we're, our indication is that anytime they need anything, uh, we'll be ready to supply it for them if, if we have it within our means. Uh, but they haven't reached out to us yet. The last thing I know was uh, they are processing on the night and then uh, the subsequent bailing of them, uh, but uh, we're waiting to hear from them. Uh, but I guess your question can be answered quite simply that we're ready. Whatever they need, we'll, we'll provide for them. I see. W what is the status of those who were arrested as we speak now? These 16 persons who were arrested by the police. Um, well, I, from uh, what I, I know, the, the, the statements were taken. Uh, the police have started the investigation. They were bailed. All of them were bailed. Uh, so they are now on bail uh, pending... The investigation. I haven't heard anything today, any movement on, on the police front, but uh, my understanding is that they've started their investigation and when they need us, uh, we'll be available to help them with anything, uh, any information that they would be uh, needing to help them in the investigation. Actually, just this uh, afternoon, uh, we uh, had a, a meeting with uh, the management of the program at UTV, uh, led by the general secretary. And we made the same uh, assurances to them, given uh, that they are also interested in seeing uh, the investigations proceed. We've made that assurance to them that we're ready uh, at any time to support the police to uh, conclude their investigations as soon as possible. See, but you see, well, you said they, they've been granted bail, so now we, we know their status. Beyond condemning the act as a party and urging the police to investigate, and you're saying you're cooperating with them, 
are you as a party going to sanction these people who openly identify themselves as members of the MPP on the video that's gone viral? Say they are constituency executives, uh, they are polling station executives as well. As a party, are you going to sanction them? Yes, um, um, I think that uh, the party's disciplinary uh, committee will uh, uh, be duly notified, I think, uh, and then they will take action. The, the, the present understanding is that it will probably uh, be a consideration that the region would look at. Uh, I think that earlier on this afternoon, the regional chairman uh, joined us for that meeting with uh, the UTV uh team and then uh, he was under the impression uh, that uh, the, the region they would take swift action uh to be able to uh, activate the display procedures of the party to look at uh what they have done uh, to determine if uh there, there are any sanctions at all uh, deserving of their conduct to be to be um, to be brought against them so i think that there are efforts within the party but being that today is the first, uh, the first working day after the incident, I'm sure we'll probably learn a bit more in the course of the week exactly what they are doing on that front. Well, I see. Uh, you say that the, the, the party would now take a decision on what to do and uh, you, are, you, you are now sort of deciding to, to sanction them. But what would the party take into consideration in finally take, taking that decision to sanction them? Because you have already condemned this in the statement that you issued and signed yourself. So, and it's quite clear, if you're condemning it, it means that you are not supporting the action perpetrated by these persons. So it's been what? Almost 72 hours or so after this incident? What would you take into consideration in deciding to sanction them after condemning the act? Yeah, very well. But then, uh, notwithstanding that, the committee will still have to sit. They have to give them uh, occasion to explain what, what they did, what their motivation was. Uh, there is no doubt that the party has condemned what they have done. But uh, you can you can uh, summarily co uh, you know uh, condemn their act as a disciplinary committee without hearing from them. So they will give them that occasion to explain themselves, and then they, uh, the committee will take a decision. Uh, even though they, what they have done is obvious, uh, based on the party's uh, denunciation uh, of the act, it's not uh, uh, enough to just say that they be condemned without giving a hearing. So they will be given the occasion to explain themselves, and the committee will make a decision on that. I see. The, the argument, and, and before I let you go, the argument has been made quite forcefully, and this is supported by the likes of your own party member and a stalwart for that matter, a former minister for environment, science, technology, innovation, Professor Kobna from Pombwate. And we'll get to the statement he issued um, earlier today. He makes the point that to the extent that previous instances perpetrated by thugs associated within the MPP have not been dealt with decisively by the party, all of these previous instances have emboldened some of these people to do what they did. So he makes reference to the, your party's Delta Force attack on the Ashanti Regional Security Coordinator in 2017 when they, they, they stormed his office and, and just pulled him out of the office, threw him out. We have that video, we'll recall it. And then also uh, the, the attack on the courts in the Ashanti region as well which was condemned by the United Nations as well. So he says that, look, you, you as a party haven't decisively dealt with these previous instances. So you're sort of emboldening these people to do what they're doing. Hello, Mr. Agba. Well, Alfred, you know, it's a human institution and, and people's motivations are what they are. But the party has uh, its own uh, uh, measures to, to address these things. Um, and so my my approach is not to look at what has gone before, but what is before us. How is this issue going to be dealt with? Uh, our standards are very clear that uh, acts that brings the party's name into disrepute are not to be countenanced. So the disciplinary committee will be minded by the magnitude of uh, 
what they have done and to, to what extent uh, is injured the party's image and then on account of that arrive by the appropriate sanction. Our constitution really is not uh, clear cut in terms of what uh, sanctions should be given and then to what extent. Uh, so it is with the this plan committee to arrive at uh, what they find within uh, reasonable limits to be uh, the appropriate sanction. So I just don't want uh, the impression to be created that somehow uh, nothing will be done. Uh, if nothing is done, it will not be because the processes were not activated. It will perhaps be subject to the conclusion of the hearing and what a determination of the committee would be. But I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, when they sit on it, uh, they, they will look at it uh, on the face of it to see really uh, what the issues are and then uh, conclude appropriately. Well... We'll wait to see how the coming days will look like and what the outcome of this committee's uh, investigations will be. But the evidence of what we've seen in the video is quite clear, and that's why we've condemned it. Thank you. Richard Ayagba is Director of Communications of the MP. Thank you for joining us. But just to take you down memory lane, and these are references that have been made by the likes of Professor Kobna and Paul Bati. This is what happened in March 2017 when a vigilante group um, affiliated with the NPP Delta Force, on a Friday morning, stormed the premises of the Ashanti Regional Coordinating Council, demanding the removal of the Regional Security Coordinator, one George J. Take a look. So this is what happened in, in, in March 2017. And guess what? In April, specifically on the 6th of April, that same year, this same group, Delta Force, stormed the circuit court and freed its members who were on trial for attacking a government appointee on March 24, 2017. Take a look. Guess what Professor Kovran from Pombwating says, B based on all I've just shown you, he makes reference to that as well. In his previous in his statement he issued this morning, take a look at the excerpts of Professor Pombwating's statement. He says, I am puzzled that a tradition that has long been associated with believing in exchange of ideas, respect for rule of law, will have its members attack a media house. He goes on to say, perhaps these facts have taken a cue from how the government and the party have allowed impunity to fester and grow in the NPP, unquote. It con continues that if I recall, no one was allowed to be punished when similar groups went to the seat of government in Ashanti region to attack the then national security coordinator. Again, no one was made to face the law when these brutes attacked a court in Kumasi, making the lady judge who was sitting on that case, run for her life in the full glare of the public. He says that to the extent that no one was made to face the law, clearly it's emboldening some of these people to, to do what they did today. 
that's where he raises the issues. But what we've heard from the MPP now, that the committee will be established to look into what happened. And then a decision will be communicated. But the police is also looking into this matter. We understand all the persons who are arrested have been granted bail as we speak. We're following this quite closely. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, embattled former sanitation minister Cecilia Dapa praised the court to hear the Office of Special Prosecutor's case against him uh, earlier than scheduled because the freezing of her account and seizure of her money is causing her hardship and, and stress. Well, this is Ghana tonight. Now, just uh, take, take a look at exactly what um, has played out, at least in this statement from Cecilia Dapa. Martin Pebo is private legal practitioner. He's going to be joining us on Zoom um, in a bit on this matter um, to, to look into exactly the specific concerns that Cecilia Dapa raises about why she wants the case to be moved and head on the 11th of October, which is just two days away. Um, she says that the case against her earlier should be brought, at least. So I'm asking for an abridgment of time because the freezing of her accounts and seizure of her money is causing her hardship and stress. These are portions of the statement um, that she put out there and which we'll get into shortly. Take a look at this. This is what was put out earlier today. This is it. First off, she says, one, as a result of this sequence of events, I have been denied access to my bank account for over two months. This has caused me and is causing me hardship, stress, and embarrassment. This is what she says. We have filed, it says every, it says every day's delay is determining the respond, respondent's motion will, will, will cause them, that's me, Further hardship says we have filed our affidavit in opposition, and this has been uh, the respondents repeat an application for confirmation orders. He has foreknowledge of the basis of our position and will not be prejudiced by an abridgment of time. That is what Cecilia Dapa earlier uh, posted, and then she also says that in the circumstances. We pray this honorable court to abridge time for the hearing of the respondent's motion for confirmation of order of freezing of suspected tainted property and confirmation of the seizure of account. We recall that when this matter first came up and the monies that were seized on the 18th of September, if you recall this particular issue. Now, this case was scheduled to be heard next week. This is on the 18th of October. Now, Cecilia Dapa is asking that the courts move the case forward because of the issues of embarrassment that she says she's facing. There are aspects of this case, in fact, this statement that we we're looking into. Take a look at this as well. Now, she makes reference to, if you recall, that, that on the OSP's position on this matter, the money is that were retrieved from her house, the 590000 over $590,000 and the over 2 million Ghana cities were carefully concealed in wraps, polythene bags and envelopes and kept in obscure places at her residence. It says there are no financial records and traces of, of the origins of the said monies reportedly stolen from her residence. That's another issue that the OSP pushed out in this position. And then Cecilia Dapa in her response in this case says the OSP's actions are based on false allegations and that her dead brother's account was opened with funds collected at his funeral. And she's a signatory to that account. And the transfers was to pay school fees of her dead brother's children. So the, 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 the funeral donations were put in the accounts that she's a signatory of. You recall that the OSP had raised 
fundamental issues with the dead brother's account being accessed by Cicely Adapa. Well, Cicely Adapa is going on to make the point that, well, yes, the account was accessed by her, but she's a signatory, and that the court should refuse the request for confirmation and order the release of the cash seized and unfreezing of the said accounts. It's on the basis of this that she is making this particular claim. Now, one person who has been following this case quite closely is private legal practitioner Martin Pebble. He's going to be joining us right after this quick break. We will get into this matter and the latest on Cecilia Dapa. This is Ghana Tonight. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of Flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the Flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. I want you so bad, Alpha Cracker. I want you. I wanna say yes, I can't resist. I want you. Ooh, I want wow. you, Alpha Cracker. I want you so bad, Alpha Cracker. <laughs> Have a goodness rich in milk and butter in Alpha Cracker. Yummy and deliciously crunchy. Alpha Crackers, simply irresistible. This advert is FD approved. Ghana for your friend in another day. Semijina ha, na eye Franco television. Pa pa pa, a mo dia bega so no. Na mi gusu a mi di ho adanse e chero. So we see hotels, offices, schools, apartment. Eye Franco television. Ababa wa, abranti e. O pe TV di aba wo dem a. Ye wo size is be brave wo ho. Ye wo 24 inches wo ho. Ye wo 32 wo ho. Ye wo 43 wo ho. Ye wo 55. Na ka si e 65 inches. Now, Franco Trading Enterprise and your television, Papa Pa, and the border form. I When you have the extra bit of ambition in your heart, you also need extra bit of energy to come through. And for that, Rush Energy is the perfect boost to get over the line. Created in the USA and proudly made in Ghana. Thanks to the unique formula, you have the power of ginseng. The benefit of vitamins and all the energy of inositol, taurine and caffeine. Anytime you need to go beyond, Rush Energy will help you get there. Our mission here at TV3 is that the news comes first. And that's the promise of News Central. With reporters every corner of the country. To attend reaction to production with the lions and experts across the subjects that affect you the most. We stay across the big stories that impact you the most as they break, develop, and evolve into major national issues. With all angles covered across the country and across every subject. I am Kemeni Amano. And I am Eric Mawina Egbeta.
News Central. Coming soon on TV3. TV3, first in news. Ladies and gentlemen, mark your calendars for the most spectacular event of the year. On Saturday, October 14, the Aviation Social Center transforms into a food lover's paradise as we proudly present the TV3 Schools Connect Food Bazaar and Kitchen Wars Grand Finale. It's not just a food festival, it's a party too. Which senior high school wins the basketball and five-a-side soccer tournament? It's a showdown like no other. And for all you nostalgic Seekers, we've got the sweet sounds of old school music to transport you back in time. And now the big one, the grand finale of Kitchen Wars. Watch as the final four schools battle it out for culinary supremacy. Who will be crowned the champion of the kitchen? TV3 Schools Connect on Saturday, October 14 is the ultimate fusion of food, music, sports and entertainment. So save the date, tell your friends and get ready to savor the flavors. TV3 Schools Connect and Kitchen Wars Grand Finale. Where food meets fun. Kitchen walks, your school fit cook. The TV3 Schools Connect is sponsored by Gino, PGL, and Napa Foods. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook. There's a feature on 279 all across the world on 3news.com. The twists and turns of the tale of Cecilia Tapa and the special prosecutor never seems to end. And, and Martin Pebo is private legal practitioner, uh, is joining us on Zoom. Uh, Martin Pebo, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. So the latest with this is, and I'm sure you've been following this quite closely, Cecilia Dapa says that the monies that were in her brother's, as deceased brother's account, were, were the funeral donations at his funeral and that she was a signatory to the account so she was using that to pay the school fees of the deceased brother's children that's how come she even had access to the account in the first place does that answer the, the critical questions about the operationalization of this account even when the brother has not expressly stated anywhere about orders being given to to her in that manner yeah, so it doesn't. That explanation doesn't answer the question at all, at least so far, not based on my understanding of this case. You see, the thing is that even if that was the case, there would have been the need to show evidence. You see, the key thing is that to be able to operate the deceased brother's account, there was a need to have a letters of administration, right? So that then it's in the name of the estate. But you don't find that evidence. I don't know which bank, perhaps maybe we we'll have to bring in the bankers and that would be odd. Which bank would do open an account in the name, okay, just of the disease estate, uh, the deceased brother's name. I mean, which bank would open an account in the deceased brother's name just like that? It's not, it's not done. I mean, as far as I'm aware, even from the name of the account, you know that this belongs to a disease. So this is what they'll do. In the estate of a son, uh -huh, so if such would, if it's Kofi Mensa, uh -huh, they do the estate of uh, Kofi Mensa. So you see that there will be evidence to show that this is an estate account. So far, she hasn't shown that evidence. You see, the main thing we need to answer is that the way Madame Dapa is going about this case, it doesn't exude any confidence. It doesn't show that she's confident that she can give an answer. All that long time, you see now, she's giving this, uh, what do you call it, explanation. The first time we didn't see, we didn't. So if the way she's going about it, look, listen, the truth is just one. If there was such truth, why would she, would she sit from July? And then in October, she's now proffering this advice. She's been flip-flopping. You see, first she said the money belongs to uh, the diseased brother. That's the, uh, uh, at the point she said 800,000 belongs to the diseased brother. Then lawyer William Kusi sought to sue on behalf of the brother's wife. Then she backtracked. So you see that this explanation she's now giving for 
this account just because she's, her story has not uh, stuck together from the one it doesn't give that explanation where is the paperwork where is the paperwork you see so for me so if, has, even if she, she states in there that uh she's a signatory a co-signatory to the to, to this to this account in the name of her deceased brother and the funeral donations were put in that account to help pay for her brother's deceased brother's children's school fees in fact that part of the statement is going to put on the screen right now Th that that it does not in any way answer the question about that authority she had to access the account even if she was a co-signatory yeah so the thing is that uh, she says she's a co-signatory right uh, let me double check. As far as I'm aware, the, she didn't add the mandate forms. Did you? So now I, I want to see if I can find. Mm -hmm. I didn't see. Do you see the mandate forms on the account? No. Yeah, well, so that is it. Yeah, so that is it. That, that's just the answer. We need the mandate forms. So she will have to bring the bank and all this work. Look. So can see this thing uh, 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 we all know a person is innocent until proven guilty, all those things. Yes. So we have to grant Madame Dapa some slack. We have to cut her some slack. But she's actually not prepared to take that slack because of the manner these answers are being given. The truth is just one. The mandate forms, you go to the bank, knowing who Madame Dapa is, big woman like this, or oh, any bank that you are in trouble like this, quickly, they'll be willing to help. Get out the mandate form. So if you would see, and if you get a mandate form, you know what OSU will be doing? They will ask to see the original so that they can do forensics on those forms to see that paper. Is it that old enough and etc. So it's not just uh, a matter of coming up to say, oh, this account was open for the funeral. No, they'll bring the mandate forms. You feel and those forms, you know, there's a way, the paper, there's a way of testing the paper to see the age of the paper to find out whether the, the paper is old enough to match the time the account was said to have been opened, etc. And other forensic things. So, please, me until the mandate forms are brought out. That's why we say the mandate forms. I mean, the forms that she filled in, mm -hmm. allegedly filled in to open the account. So those are brought out and OSP conducts its test on the form to see the, the age and all those other forensics. I cannot uh, believe Madam that first story. No, this should have come out a long time ago, a long time ago. Mm -mm. So sometimes I see that your silence may mean consent, your silence coupled with other false steps and other things that don't gel so far. Look, like we keep even saying, one of the things that would have made Madame Dapes case very easy is that, you know, Article 286 Clause 4 says that if we find money with any public officer and that money cannot be attributed to the income, gift, loan, or inheritance of that public officer, then that money or any other property is said to be illicit wealth, okay? Unexplained wealth, right? So, Madame Dapa should have explained this money away a long time ago. So far, she's not been able to explain. You see, uh -huh, that even reminds me. The other story she gave about Demacare Cosmetics mm -hmm. and Demacare Enterprise. Both companies tend out not to be for her. Uh, well, they are both uh, enterprises, not limited liability companies. So both business entities tend out not to right. be for her. And so many other things. So th this story is hard to believe. I don't want to use the word cock and bull story because we must grant her some uh, this is slack a little bit. But this one is a hard sell. It's a hard sell. Mm -hmm. Lawyer, maybe in a, in a minute, then I'm rounding up on it. Because sister, she, she had a power also makes the point that the OSP relied, quote, on her caution statement taken from her earlier to refreeze her account and reseize the monies that were retrieved in their home, despite the earlier court order. Did the OSP do anything procedurally wrong in this, in this instance? Not at all. So what he's saying is that he said, despite the earlier court order, let's explain. 
What was the earlier court order? The earlier court order was that her money be returned to her, right? Good. Mm -hmm. And the asset, the bank account be unfrozen. Yes. And the OSU complied with that. And then, after complying, OSU now receives the money, the currency. So, in law, it happens all the time. So there was a problem, the court says give to her. The court didn't bar OSP. And even that wasn't, nobody put such a request before the court that bar OSP forever from receiving. No, it happens all the time. Yeah, you ask lawyers who are familiar with practice. Mm -hmm. Police take somebody to court, or let the prosecution take somebody to court. But often the police does right. uh, some of the smaller courts. Then the person is discharged, maybe because the police have not been able to gather the evidence, okay. all those things. Yeah, so they say discharge, you are free to go. You walk out, just as right. soon as you get out of the door, the accused is rearrested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when the court says you are discharged, the court has not said acquitted and discharged. No, they right. say discharged. So when the person is said to be discharged, he, he can be rearrested on the same offense and then recharged and then arraigned before the same court, and then the trial will go on. So it's practice. I see. We'll, we'll see. In fact, the, the coming days is going to be very interesting because he's applying for an abridgment of time. So we'll see if the court will grant that. But thank you so much for joining us. Well, Martin Kbebo, as always, appreciate your time. Martin Kbebo is a private legal practitioner. Coming up next year on Ghana Tonight, the minority in parliament is this evening reacting to the comments by the majority leader, Osechi Mensah Bonsu, that, the, that they, the minority, could have requested the presence of the governor of the central bank rather than staging the Occupy BOG protest. Now, my colleague Evelyn Temma sat with the majority leader, Osechi Mensah Bonsu, who is saying that the minority could have invited the governor of the central bank before parliament instead of going on, on, on that protest. And you recall that the governor himself had described this protest as unnecessary and the persons on there as hooligans. Take a look at Osechi Mensah Bonsu's position on this. We are members of parliament. We could have invited the governor to come and talk to issues that are not clear to us. You go on a demonstration, you organize a press conference against them, what you think is happening within the corridors, and then you go on a demonstration. When you come back to parliament to move a motion, do you want me to support that? Like now you have made up your mind that whatever has been done by them it's inappropriate, I'm not going to countenance it, you bring him. So if he comes to explain, are you going to take it or jettison it? That, oh, I've made up my mind, don't convince me with facts. I, 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 I don't know what he's saying. I don't know of that. You don't go out there and throw dust into the eyes of the people and give a dog a bad name to hang it. It's not right. Well, so that's the majority leader of the Chairman Sabon today. And uh, the Member of Parliament for the North Town constituency is a ranking on, on the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament. Samuel Okuja Tuablakwa is joining us on the telephone. Thank you so much, Mr. for your time here on Ghana tonight. So this is the, the majority leader's position on what you did. He says you've given the dog a bad name to hang it. If you bring a motion before Parliament, he doesn't see his side supporting it because you've, you've already hit the streets with a protest. Uh, good evening to you and good evening to all uh, your viewers. The majority leader's statements are really unfortunate and are not born out of the facts. Let's be clear. The matters that have been raised, very grave matters indeed, that have been raised against the governor and his two deputies are not matters that the minority or the NDC caucus has concocted. This is not a matter of giving the dog a bad name to hang it. This is a matter of the dog having been caught, the dog having given himself a bad name. We are talking about an audit which has been carried out by an internationally reputable firm, Deloitte. The financial statement of the 
Bank of Ghana for 2022, and the attached audits are there for all of us to read. It is a statement of fact that auditors have discovered that the Bank of Ghana has made losses, losses to the tune of 60.8 billion. It is a statement of fact that the Bank of Ghana is insolvent, is bankrupt. It has a negative equity of 55 billion. It is a matter of fact that as we speak, our reserves are at an all-time low, totally depleted. It is a matter of fact that as we speak, despite the mess that has been created, this governor has decided to put up a new plush office. And he continues to build night and day, desiccating the little that is left. He is not even minded to salvage what has been left. It is a matter of fact that as we speak, this governor has printed money illegally to the tune of 77 billion Ghana cities. These have been confirmed by the governor himself. So nobody can say that we have prejudice matters or we are calling the dog a bad name. The dog has already misconducted itself. These are very grave matters. This governor has destroyed livelihoods. He has destroyed people's lives. This is a governor who spent over 20 billion cities doing a financial sector cleanup when he was advised against this nuclear option. He could have spent far less and save these businesses. He decided to adopt the nuclear option, has collapsed over 400 banks and financial institutions. As I speak to you, more than 50,000 jobs have been destroyed. You have bank managers who are now Uber drivers. As I speak to you, thanks to the illegal printing of this governor, inflation went as high up as 54%. Hyperinflation. Inflation now in Ghana is virtually the highest in Africa and virtually anywhere in the world, over 40%, thanks to the illegal printing of money. And you know what that means to the livelihoods of, of people, how it erodes their purchasing power. Thanks to this governor, as we speak, for the first time because of his terrible monetary policy interventions, you are having all of these financial haircuts, debt restructuring. He is the one who aided the finance minister aided the, the, the vice president, Paumia, who is the head of the so-called solid economic management team, and this president, and engaged in gross economic mismanagement. So these are facts contained in an annual statement, contained in audited reports. So the majority leader cannot say that we have made up our mind, don't convince us with a fact. I mean, the, 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 the facts are clear. So, the facts are from independent sources, and it is not the minority that is making up any story. So let me understand this. So beyond what the majority leader says, you are still going to go ahead to, to move a motion or to, to table a motion to, to get the governor of the central bank and appear, before, appear before parliament? Definitely. And unfortunately, there is no way in our standing orders that says that if you don't get the support from the other side, you cannot file your motion. Indeed. Uh, a lot of the motions we have filed, if you look at the, the, the motion that has led to the ongoing inquiry into the uh, Ghana Police Service Bruhaha, the, um, the leak tape uh, uh, that uh, has become a subject of, of national discussion. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a one-sided motion. We didn't get the majority side to support us. The speaker uh, saw merit in the motion and it went through. If you look at the National Cathedral motion, which the House adopted the last time, it was a number of my colleagues and I on the NDC side who filed it. There was not a single MPP MP. So there's really nothing in our standing orders that stops us. I mean, ideally, you would wish that uh, such grave matters uh, which uh, have affected everybody, whether you're MPP or NDC, the collapse of this economy has affected everybody. And one would have thought that we will have received a certain bipartisan support. But okay. if, uh, if they want to continue with the uh, divisiveness and petty politics, 
we are going to put the lives of Ghanaians ahead of petty, cheap partisan politics. And we will file our motion. And gladly, nothing in our standing orders stops us from proceeding with a one-sided motion. Well, thank you. Parliament resumes um, soon, so we'll see how this plays out in Parliament. Thank you for your time for joining us here. You're always, you're always welcome, my friend. Samuel Okujato Ablakwa is Member of Parliament for the North Tongue Constituency, ranking on the, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament. But up next, the embattled uh, that the retired COP Alex Mensah, who's put it on record that he's, as far as about, um, last month he's retired now, we're going to have the committee sitting tomorrow. The men at the center of the IGP's leaked tape scandal have all appeared before the committee. COP Alex Mensa um, has been speaking exclusively to my colleague Kemeni Amano, and he has a few things to say about what he said before the committee and whether he's going to change his mind at all. Take a look. Well, I, I don't want to discuss what is going to happen at the committee anywhere mm. for that i will not do i'll do that after the committee shall we come back to the committee um where you had spoken about how unfairly you have been treated um you thought uh, that you had stayed in the position for too long without promotion and that for you was unfair as a police officer why do you think you were not promoted? Why, why is that important to you? See, that was an answer to a question that, that was asked by some of the committee members. And I said it, and that was the truth. Why I was not promoted, I cannot say. Those who were responsible for the promotion, they were the ones who can say it. So I cannot, but they know it. Did politics play a role in this? Sure, I know that. You know that. Yes. Tell me more. No, I don't want to say it here. I will say it there. Mm. However, you said it there, that you thought that the closeness of the current IGP to the then NDC government is why he was promoted a lot of times above you. I didn't say that. You didn't? I didn't say that. What did you say? It was a question that they, they, they were trying to impugn that, but I didn't say that. What was your response then? Because I, I, I believe I remember you answered in the affirmative. That? That you thought that it was his closeness to... No, uh, I never the, said that. Right. I never. Do you believe that his closeness to the NDC was the reason he was promoted and that politics plays a role in the promotions of police officers? Yeah, whoever says that politics does not play a role in the promotions of police officers, especially above certain ranks, does not know what he's saying. Go into the constitution, you have the police council, you have the functions of the police council. And the constitution will tell you that promotions above the assistant commissioner of police, the council will recommend it to the president for president to promote. Who is the president? Is a political figure? The police council, is a political figure? So whoever says that promotions above certain ranks doesn't have political things inside, as you know what say. Danger to the police service? Very, very. Very, very dangerous. It's something that we need to look at and take it out of the constitution. Even the appointment of the IGP is something that we need to look at it. I, I, I'm going to ask you a bit more about politics and promotions in the service, but it, I cannot go without also asking you whether or not you thought politics played a role in you going above a certain level in the police service. Yes. It what, played a role. What kind of politics played a role, played a role for you? played a role because, okay. as I said, I spent nine good years in one round. COP Alex Mensah retired there. Now, the seven-member ad hoc committee investigating this leaked audio tape that captures an alleged plot to have the president remove the Inspector General of Police will resume sittings tomorrow. And stay with us here across all media journal platforms. We will bring you every minute of the updates of that committee's hearings.
Thank you for staying with us here on Ghana Tonight. Make a day same time tomorrow. I am Alfred Okonse. Have a good night. Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint. Superior durability. Superior hiding. Superior coverage. Simply superior.